From Mimi to Gleeman via Hrothgith's spell, it's to the Dark Ages for the House of Ravel. <laughs> And welcome back to House of Revels, the Theatre Through the Ages podcast. I'm Mingma. And I'm Olivia. And we are theatre practitioners taking you on a journey through the history of theatre in Britain. From naught to now. In this episode, we're going to be discussing Anglo-Saxon theatre, early Christian drama. Ooh. I know it's a very fancy, not very snappy title, but it's the best way to communicate what I'm trying to explain to everyone. I love it. You know, who, who doesn't want a bit of churchy drama? It's going to be great. Churchy drama. <laughs> but before we get on to churchy drama, Mingma, I think maybe we should see double check if we've covered everything in Roman drama. Yes. 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 So... Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Liv, are you sure you covered everything last time? Hmm, let me think, Mingma. I think I did, but maybe I missed out something really fun and interesting that you could possibly tell me about. Well, Liv, in the midst of this research, we discovered very excitingly that the first ever named actor in Britain was a woman. Woo! Which is amazing. Yeah. It's so cool. It is, that is so cool. Her name was Verikunda. Verikunda. Sounds a bit too much like a Veruca, but you know. <laughs> it does. Um, and she, her name appears on a shard of Italian redware pottery found at Leicester. In Leicester. Uh, and she is a mime. Oh, okay. An actor who is a mime. Which is, you know, one for the equality there. Yeah. That's so cool, though. It's it's just another classic thing of, of women have been hidden from the history books for years. Mm, ooh, ooh, yeah. women. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to yeah. be talking about the first female playwright today in ooh. this podcast. So if you like women... Very exciting. <laughs> strap on if in. If you like women. Great. If you care yeah, about everyone women. Everyone who doesn't like anyone in their life who happens to be of a certain <laughs> sex, please stand up. Please, please leave. Um, Please turn (laughs) off this podcast and go. Right, shall we get into it? Let's get into it. So today, as I mentioned, I'm going to be looking at Anglo-Saxon theatre, early Christian drama. So first of all, let's have a bit of context for for this Anglo-Saxon drama, Liv. Here is where we discuss the current day events. As this form developed, what else was going on in history? What economic, political, social movements might affect performance? Okay, so Romans, to put it in a short way, they basically disappeared from Britain. They left Britain. Um, they'd gone by the early 5th century. Um, and you had the kind of intrusion slash settling of different groups of people into Britain. Um, and these different groups of people included the Jutes and the Anglos, wink, wink, um, and the Saxons. And they kind of pushed the Bretons, the people who were living in Britain, to the fringes of England. Um, And in a very short roundabout way, England became seven kingdoms. So we have this idea of um, England being split up, and that's why you hear things like the King of Wessex or the King of Northumberland. It's these different areas that it's split into. So Romans have gone, um, we've got little kingdoms popping up. So that's kind of what was happening. Hello, Game of Thrones. Hello, Game of Thrones. Exactly. Well, I wasn't even thinking about pop culture references, but that (laughs) is so true. It's just like Game of Thrones. Oh, Mm, Oh, I'm just, I'm just annoyed (laughs) and sad now. Yeah, I think, I think we're all there. We're just like, oh, it it feels like a very 2020 thing to have happened that Game of Thrones ending, but it wasn't 2020. Well, yeah, no, the real black thing would be if George R. R. Martin dies of COVID, don't, and then we really don't get the final ending. That'd be so in the, that'd be so in style. It would be so in style. Anyway, so we have these seven kingdoms. So we have the leaving of the Romans. Um, but obviously, as we know, we do not lose the influence of Romans. So we obviously still have things like roads. We have names. We have the language. We have not. Let's not forget concrete. Um, and there was this sense of a wanting to keep cultural continuity so to speak so the romans leave and people are kind of like um what do we do now uh we Mm. want to keep these traditions going so we know for example that king edwin of northumberland built himself a theater that modeled the roman kind of styles um so there's this uh small hamlet in the northern part of england called eithering um and it was excavated in the 20th century and they found all these kind of ruins from king edwin we don't 
really know much. I'm going to start before I go into... <laughs> they're kind of... There's a reason these times are called the Dark Ages. We don't really know much about what happened. Yeah, I think it's... The thing about the Dark Ages is it's... It's dark because we don't have the light to turn on what they were doing. It's not that they were completely uncivilized. No, it's, it's not don't... that they were just sitting around. We just go, mm. we don't know. You were probably doing something. And th- mm. it's kind of, this is where this po- podcast gets a little bit, um, not sad. Basically, theatre as we know it sort of disappears for a couple of hundred years in the sense of stage and audience. We have this big Roman theatre and lots of performances and that all goes away until close to 1066. But what we do have Mm -hmm. are um, strolling players. So people would walk around sort of a bit like street performers. They'd kind of set up an area and they'd perform for people. Um, They didn't need the big Royal Abbot Hall (laughs) equivalent. They just needed a small space. But we don't really know much about these players or or Mimi as they're known. But what we do know a lot about are the wandering poets of the time called Gleeman, who aren't fans of Glee. (laughs) Do you know, I did this research and I went down a big Glee trip down memory lane and I was like... Glee. Did you watch Glee, Nigma? I never. It was one of those ones that I was always told to watch. It, I did the same so thing, I and then I to. like caved when I was like eighteen. I was like, "Why did I do this? I would have loved it." <laughs> um, so we have Glee men and Scops or Scoops, but I think Scops because it's one O. And so we know quite a lot mm. about these wandering poets, and these were poets who performed their poetry. So the poetry was written for performance. So Gleeman were people who recited poetry to the company of the harp, or the Gleewood, which is where they get their name from. They sometimes attach themselves to like a particular court, but often they kind of wandered around. Now, this is really interesting because you know how we talked about in the early episodes this idea of history being what you make of it. Mm. They had the same approach to authorship, so they weren't really too fussed about whether you had written something or not. They kind of performed other people's work and they were like, it doesn't really matter that I didn't write this. I can still perform it. So I thought that was really interesting. The sense of authorship is quite amazing modern thing to come in what we actually know about poetry these poets comes from the poetry itself so um wids wids if or wids if i've said the same word exactly the same way twice but never mind um is the earliest poem written in the old english language in about the late sixth century um and actually it's a poem about a performer so the far traveler and the poem is about his reflections on his life as a wandering scot Mm. um and it also in the poem kind of contains a variety of germanic heroes that he can sing about so he's like i could tell you the tale of this or this or this or this so it's kind of a bit like lin-manuel miranda being like i could write you a musical about alexander hamilton or (laughs) such and such and such and such or cheerleaders or shakespeare's history or shakespeare's histories exactly like this is these are all the things i can do um there's also um dior not the brand uh which is a lament about um a man being replaced by a younger scop so we have the scops and gleeman um who perform poetry so now we move on to a really interesting part of history where we get the relationship between Christians and actors. So an important note is that Christianity in Britain in 380, the official religion of the Roman Empire became Christianity. So everyone started to go, oh, maybe we shouldn't ban Christianity and, and maybe, you know, Jesus was all right in the end. So Christianity spreads, it becomes more and more popular. Oh, okay. Okay, go for it, Mingma. At the time when Constantine was uh, deciding to t- change the official mm. religion to Christianity, there were two other contenders in the race. One was the cult of Mithras, mm. which is pretty Ooh. awful. And one was the cult of Isis, which was a matriarchal religion. Can you imagine what the world would have been like if, if ISIS had been... I mean, apart from the unfortunate nowadays <laughs> side. Yeah. But could you imagine? <laughs> if we'd got a matriarchal yeah. religion. I'm almost quite angry know. knowing that. It's kind of like... I mean, it's one of those... I, I, I have a notebook of ideas for plays or for shows or something. And one of them is definitely the alternative mm-hmm. history. <laughs> what happened when... <laughs> alternative history. That's a long play that you're doing though, Mima, because you've got to do like the whole 2000 years i think it'd be more kind of i'd probably go kind of slightly steampunk rogue with it so it'd be like it's in victorian britain except that we've always been a matriarchal society or something and just kind of like do a i see i don't know so the idea of queen victoria isn't so like Mm. oh woman 
I like it. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so basically, Christianity becoming mm. very popular. So there was a big Christian disapproval of actors and performers. Um, in 679, the Council of Rome required English clerics to ban both jesters and players from their premises. Um, an English diplomat in the 18th century made reference to Mimi, advising that it was better to please God than the actors and better to have care for the poor rather than mimes. They also kind of put loads of bans about... Um, actors performing in priestly robes and they were like don't perform in our garments you can't do it no 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 which Mm -hmm. i just like the idea of it was death to any actor who puts a garment on in a priestly rank was that specifically priests who fancied themselves on stage or was that actors pretending to be priests i think it was more actors pretending to be priests Mm. but funnily enough priests who found themselves on stage comes later in this episode okay i'll shut up and they hated them as well (laughs) (laughs) they hated them as well you have this kind of mix of christians very popular hating actors and you also have these poets and there is some crossover so um you have the Exodus poem, which tells the adventure of the Israelites trapped between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. And this was written by a man called um, Cademan, who was uh, a herdsman. <laughs> a herdsman? Man who looks after animals. A big, humble... He was a cowherd cow herd. <laughs> anyway so he was this cow herd employed um, by the abbess of hild in whitby and basically it's believed that he wasn't very smart he went to bed one night he was visited by an angel and he woke up with the you know he was divinely inspired and he could write these amazing poems um and so that's what he did and he performed these poems to the members of the abbey so mingma let's pause a second so Christians ban, exile, kill actors mm-hmm. and stop them from performing in priestly robes, but then welcome poets to perform yes. stories? Talk about hypocritical. Um, hmm. Hey, Mingma, what's the deal with Christians and actors? I don't know, Liv. Why do ancient Christians hate <laughs> actors? Thanks for asking, Mingma. So the reason um, Christians hated actors is basically because there were injunctions against dressing up in the Old Testament. So an early Christian author, Tertullian, believed that everything fabricated is corrupt. Um, And basically, actors are liars, and lying is a sin. It is kind of like identity theft, but like everyone's in on it. Which seems like, well, if everyone knows, then surely it isn't. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, well... I don't know. And also, I don't think they were particularly keen on men dressing up as women in pantomimes. <laughs> I don't think I don't think cross-dressing was a particularly big thing in the church. A really interesting discussion with the trustee of Troubadour Stageworks, which, two listeners, uh, is my uh, theatre company. And uh, this amazing trustee who terrifies the lights out of me, so I'm barely telling her about this podcast because she's an Oxford academic. Um, so the very idea of her judging what we're saying. Well, she can't she, listen. She can't listen to it now because she, you just said she terrifies yeah. you. I mean, so. I love her as well. She's amazing. She told us about this, uh, this city in kind of Asia Minor, which is the o- opposite end of the Roman Empire. Right. And it was a place where if you were a Pompey and you wanted to get a good Roman statue, like with us, they exported. So it was this mm-hmm. city, which was kind of situated in modern day Turkey, which was the place where you would go and get your statues from. So, <laughs> or like, I suppose, like the export of Stonehenge, you know, it was Wales where you weren't, you know, though it's considered like yeah. Celtic, you'd go and get it from over here. This, this place had this kind of amazing avenue of the most beautiful statues, which are the ones which kind of were dug out of Rome mm-hmm. and what we can now consider absolute Roman statues. Mm-hmm. It all came from this place. There is fourth century mutilation of all the genitals and public bits of all of the statues down this enormous colonnade so even at the very beginning when Constantine uh, first changed to uh, uh, to Christianity the Christian priest went along mm. and just nipped off that bit and this bit and that bit oh and... my god! so from the very very beginning there's been a weird thing about sexuality yeah and about cross-dressing and straight lacing it's a very interesting thing to think about it, it, that is really mm. weird as well like the idea of just kind of going along well this kind of comes up the kind of well it's a lot of religions and a lot of kind of cultures and you know god knows britain invaded its fair share of <laughs> fair share of places but this thing of like just overlapping and rewriting history and being like nope let's get rid of that and like that didn't exist we'll just slap our thing on top of it instead but also they what they didn't like as well is this idea of um 
an actor performing evil on stage because it, they kind of felt like they're basically doing the evil thing. So when you look at evil or when you perform an evil act as a character, you are basically becoming that evil. Ooh, that's really interesting. It is really interesting, but it's also very weird because they're like, no, you can read about it and you can listen to songs about it. You just can't look at it. That's really interesting because that's also, again, completely opposite to the Greek idea of tragedy yeah. you have to watch tra- tragedy because then it purges you like a catharsis almost yeah but also they thought what was even worse was evil people pretending to be good on stage so people actors playing good characters because they thought that's a bigger kind of lie and uh, a bigger sin in because a way. actors were inherently evil well sort of yeah they're all kind of oh just put them get rid of them put them in the <laughs> corner we don't want them ban yeah. them kill them so that is a very roundabout way <laughs> of trying to describe the very complicated situation mm. in the early Anglo period. Um, so we have the church hating actors in theatre, but accepting some forms of storytelling such as poetry. And we also have this, the spread and rise of Christianity. Let's move on to the origins of the theatre style. We trace its beginnings and what influenced its development. Okay, so we have the church... And we also have the pagan drums. Yeah. Church had tried to take over the pagan festivals by very simply overlapping. So they kind of have the pagan festivals and the pagan traditions. And they go, I tell you what, let's just put Christmas very conveniently in the middle of all these pagan festivals. Let's just pretend. So you'd have these pagans and be like, oh, there's this new festival happening. I wonder what this is. Pagan temples they'd come and they'd just kind of go, and now it's a Christian temple. And they'd slowly overlap. Um, But basically they realised, Christians realised that they'd never be able to get rid of the pagan love Mm. and the common people's love of drama. So they thought about a way of trying to use theatre in their religion in order to attract the pagans. (laughs) Does that make sense? As we kind of said in the Fireside episode, it's the idea of stories have been around as long as language. And especially, you know, and if you want people to turn up to your new thing, you put on a show. Yeah, exactly. You make it, you give it that novelty factor, you make it as interesting Mm. as possible. Because you had a group of people, well, a very large population of people who had been deprived of this tradition of of stories and they wanted the theatric so to speak yeah i i have mm-hmm. a theory which at some point i want to kind of look further into uh but i think that really up until well actually no actually i would say kind of almost all the way through and particularly in rural areas though we think of when we look at every parish church and go god everyone was so much more christian at that point and all the rest of it i think that 90 mm-hmm. percent of the people who were who went to those parish churches were agnostic at best And it's this whole thing Mm. of, well, it's a good show. It's where you go and visit and see social life. The reason why why the Virgin Mary is so much larger, especially in Italy, actually, is because of, for example, in in Venice, there is the lagoon goddess, Mm. the mother, the deity of of Venice. And so does it matter if we're looking at her or looking at him? And we have a a great building which can be part of the community. Fun fact is... um, you know those kind of weird um, railings which separate the altar from the nave? Oh, yeah. All the way through up until the Victorians, the nave was the community area. That's where you had the market. That's where the livestock shat. Mm. That is where <laughs> the plays were put on. Uh, and that barrier was literally put up to stop the sheep and the cows shitting on the altar <laughs> originally. And it, I love... I just, and it was a really intentional I move. Know. Uh, by the by, the bishop mm. in about the eighteen, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury in about the eighteen fifties was an economic reason to pew the entirety of England because they needed to buy wood oh. for a certain reason and also to get all of that stuff out, even though that stuff had been more important. I see. all the way through. So they were like, everyone sit down a little bit, stop having all the sheep. It was this sudden thing of this is meant to be a house of God, mm. and but what we need to remember is because I mean we're going to talk about churches so much. It, as we continue yeah, through this is that are. really the church was the community center and you had the end bit which was the religion yeah. and on sundays you would turn to the end and you would talk but no one sat down you'd be standing up in general mm. you the entire point of these buildings was that it was a meeting place and somewhere where you could move and yeah could go yeah that sense of community which as we talked about i think at the beginning that that kind of need for a tribe and the need to connect with other people is so universal and that's kind of where storytelling comes from is that connection Mm. and so yeah i can see even now i look at um i mean i'm not particularly religious myself as you can probably tell (laughs) from my my lack of extensive church knowledge but 
that that sense of community you automatically get in the church and people I know who are religious and they have that you know community and the people that they know at church and it's a big deal you know you have like the harvest festival and like you know stuff at Christmas and mass and all stuff throughout the year where they do stuff with their church friends it's just yeah it's a whole yeah. community so like you say it wasn't even they're not necessarily all kind of christian converts but it's just what you kind of did i guess as well it's very much like oh we're going to the church oh, we're going to the church well we're, it's where we always was um it's your yeah. community it's your community exactly but what's interesting is as i said the church sort of hated actors and hated the kind of portrayal of evil as they thought it did evil they were also incredibly like ritualistic and dramatic in the way that they perform certain rituals which is basically how this next theater style evolved mm. so for example when the church wanted to convert a pagan temple to um, a christian temple it conducted a rite of consecration so this is hopping over to france in the ninth century in france um how this worked was the bishop would uh, walk around the building mm. once and approach the door, knock three times, um, and in Latin, command it to open with the words of the 24th Psalm. Um, the priest, already concealed in the building, would respond with, Who is this king of Norway? And then the bishop would <laughs> circuit the building twice more, repeat the question twice more, um, and then on his third circuit, the bishop would reply, even the ha Lord of Hosts, he is the King of Glory. Then the door would be flung open and the hidden priest would rush out as if he were the spirit of evil fleeing the holy place. <laughs> like, it's so dramatic. This idea of, like, a little priest hiding in and then, like, a bishop walking around three times this building and, like, knocking on the door. And then he's like, oh, I'm gone. I'm the evil and I'm leaving. I wonder where um, the three times happens, where that comes from. I... I think, but I think three is quite a common number as well in terms yeah, I of... I mean, it's common as one, two, three. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no. Thanks, Mingo. <laughs> well, no, because also you've got, like, the Holy Trinity and, like, the idea of three and, like, the crucifix and the cross having the three points. There's also and... the whole thing of, like, if you uh, go around a church widdershins three times at twilight, you're going to enter mm. fairyland and that kind of stuff as well. Widdershins is kind of anti-clockwise. right. But so I love the go. word, so you know it's <laughs> Widdishins. Yeah. It seems so, that's quite like it sounds so like quintessentially British. Like, oh, I'm from Widdishins, mm. <laughs> or my name is like Hannah Widdishins. I quite I like really it. like it. I think yeah, it's, it's such a cool name. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it's the word of the podcast. Oh, we're gonna have a word of the podcast. So also at this time, you had these rituals which were really big, and then you had the desire for the church to use more antiphonal singing. So singing in harmony was a really big thing for christians so they were like oh it's all about christian values harmony we love it we love singing in mm. harmony so they wanted to increase the amount of antiphonal singing that they did so antiphonal singing is kind of like a rap battle a rap in battle. my head that's not quite it at all that's completely <laughs> well basically it's two groups of people singing in a caller response so you've got group a and they're going la 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 group b go like fa la 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 and then group a go back like da 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 but obviously latin mm. words not random things so all these kind of came together um, and that's the origin of what we call the liturgical dramas and early Christian drama. Shall we move on to the form itself? These are the main features of the theatre style. So we have this desire for uh, people to look at rituals and we also have this emergence of antiphonal singing and these combine in 970 um, with the trope of the Easter Mass called Let's Get Latin. No, it's not called Let's Get Latin. <laughs> it's not called Let's Get Latin. It's it's let's it's called Quaem Curatus. So the Quaem Curatus is a Latin call and response piece taken from the extracts of the Gospels of Luke, Peter, and mm -hmm. Mary. So it features in the Regularis Concordia, which is kind of like this rule book for Benedictine monasteries, um, created by Ethelwald, Bishop of Winchester. So the Quaem Quiratus was performed at, during the Easter Mass um, in its three lines, um, and it dramatises the visit of the three Marys, the Virgin Mary, 
the Mary Magdalene and Mary, the sister of Lazarus, to the tomb of Jesus Christ's body. So what happens is they go to the tomb, they find it empty, there's an angel guarding it, and the angel says, Whom do you seek? The parts of the marriage reply, Jesus of Nazareth. The angel then replies, He is not here, he has risen as predicted, spread the news of his resurrection. It's not very dramatic, Mm. it's those three lines, but that is basically credited as being the resurgence of drama in Britain, those three lines. Um, Because what happens is these three lines become very popular. It spreads very quickly um, and it's expanded dramatically. So costumes are introduced. Um, Suddenly, instead of two parts of the choir singing it, it becomes the priest singing the role of the angel and three of the choir boys playing the Marys. So the priest then starts to wear different clothes. The Marys start to carry props, like different things from the church around as their like spices. That sounds so Um, dodgy. It sounds so dodgy. I know I'd say that's spices, but you know what I mean. They're just going to adorn things on the body of Jesus. That's even worse, honey. Um, (laughs) Have we got a man who's just... Is this a scandal thing? There's a guy in there saying, guys, just adorn me in front of everyone and let's see what happens. (laughs) Just adorn me. (laughs) Just give me some spices. No, but that's basically what it is. It's these three lines. But people went crazy for it. And it became really popular. Um, And then what happens is, this is the part we might Mm. recognise, is other parts of the Bible start to get the same treatment. So you have this at Easter Mass, and you also have parts of the Nativity. Um, And this then slowly spreads, so it moves away from being performed at the altar, around the altar, to different parts of the church, and this kind of staging is changed. The story of the three Marys visiting the tomb expands to include a spice merchant. Let me guess, who Um, sells his products in the church? He sells his products in the church for a great (laughs) deal. (laughs) A a sneaky discount, only $9.99 when you sign up this service. But yeah, it basically massively expands. There's a spice merchant. Most people get involved. They eventually had the bright idea to translate these stories into kind of the common language. So they'd all all been in Latin. No one could really understand what they were saying because only kind of people in clergy Mm. spoke Latin. Yeah, and that's a point worth mentioning even, that actually this desire to communicate in antiphonal singing and, and tell these stories is a way of the church trying to kind of educate the masses about the bible because kind of the masses were illiterate they didn't speak latin they were just trying to understand give them a way for them to understand it so that's how it mm. started this kind of nativity the quaim curatis <laughs> <laughs> what was that my enormous pile of books on the table just crashed down <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> which books are they which books are they you've got to tell us which books oh, they God. are <laughs> uh, I think it was actually our favourite uh, female mime she's come back to haunt me <laughs> <laughs> she's come back to throw yeah. things at you or throw ghost. things away but she's saving my life for finding her name I was I like know. I thought she's still there so she can't have like gone <laughs> you just heard this kind of clatter <laughs> Clat- and was like someone is coming to kill <laughs> you <laughs> okay so that is basically it in stars now I know I'm talking a lot, Mingma, but it's okay. It's okay. It's so just about fine. I, it's it's fine. okay. It's just about fine. I would like to tell you about the first female playwright. Ooh. If All I right. may. She's not British. Mm-hmm. She is, um, in fact, German. If you haven't listened to our episode on Roman theatre, I would recommend you go and do that now because one of our main players in the episode features in this story about Roswitha. And her name is translated to the mighty shout or the loud call. She kind of chose it herself. And I think that's a pretty clear indication of just how badass she Mm -hmm. was. Um, So she was a canoness. um, And they are kind of like nuns, but they're allowed to own property and servants. And they can wear whatever type of wimple they like, (laughs) which I think is a nice, nice detail. They're like... I can own property. I can own service. I can wear whatever type of wimple I want to. It sounds so bad to say this with, um, considering it's a nun and all, but wimple just sounds so dirty. (laughs) I can wear whatever wimple I like. (laughs) Is it also um, Uh, slight, mm. well, slight controversial now, but could she give the sacrament? Because... I, I mean, it, it's a debated point, but there's a whole thing that basically for the first 1,000 years of Christianity, female priests were allowed to give the sacrament. And Hildegard this. of Bingen, 
is one of the classic oh yeah classic ones who who can and and there's documentary evidence of her doing so so i'm interested if uh ross fitter yes well done yes <laughs> do you want me to spell it for you it's a really Go fun spelling it's h-r-o-t-s-v-i-t-h-a oh, wow ross fitter um, I don't know if she could give the sacrament, actually. I'll put it this way. If she could, she probably would. She was incredibly well-read. Mm. She basically read everything. She knew a lot about yeah. the world. She was really interesting. So she was incredibly well-read. And she loved, loved, loved the work of Terence, the Roman playwright. Terence! Yeah, Terence comes back. She loved Terence. But she was really religious obviously and she was really worried that people would read the work of Terence and be prefer it to the holy scriptures so she was like i know what i'll do i'll translate Terence, but i'll make it holy <laughs> so she took the comedies of Terence and gave them christian themes so she wrote six mm. plays and they're all about chastity <laughs> oh man but you're doing so parody. well Rosvista. No, I can't do it. Rosvista. Rosvista. They're all about, like, virgin martyrs. But they're really funny. Um, so her most famous one is called... Uh, big breath. Dulcitius? Dulcitius. Dulcitius. Dulcitus? Dulcitius. It might be Dulcitus. Um, it depends, on, on, uh, depends whether we're in church Latin or normal Latin. And there's my nerd mm. side. Um, that is... <laughs> Well, I'm going to go with Dulcitius. Um, and so this play, Dulcitius, is based on the real-life Roman governor of Thessalonica in the late 3rd century. And he basically persecuted um, Christian women. Nice. In the play, I know, it's, it's you can tell this is yeah, going to be standard, a comedy. Yeah, standard, you know. <laughs> standard. It's, I, what I'm about to explain is not very funny, but... I think we've just got to take that as yeah. it is. So in the play, there are three young Christian sisters. Um, Agape, like Sharpe. That's where <laughs> I remember the rhyme. I was like, it's not, she's not like Sharpe, uh, going back to naughty mm. throwbacks. Um, Keon and Irina. And they refuse to renounce Christianity. And so they're locked up by the big bag evil man of the play um they're then questioned by dulcitius and he is like oh i really fancy you um you guys should be locked up in the kitchen where i can visit you more often mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah i know what it's a chat really up line like, mm. what a chat up line but also very creepy um so they're locked up in the kitchen but it's okay because they pray um they don't want him to assault them and they pray and so he comes into the kitchen and thinks the pots and pans in the kitchen are the women. He makes up with the <laughs> pots and pans. Oh God. He gets covered in soot. He leaves the kitchen and people think he's a demon and they beat him up. <laughs> uh, it, you see what I mean? It is quite funny. What on earth is he it? gets beaten up. Also, who has left the washing up so long all the pots and pans are covered in soot? Or oh, what the hell was he doing? Where's the, also, the pots and pans that meant the... <laughs> I think he was kind of like... I'm not really sure whether he was like... He's got confused. Mm. And he's like thinking that they look like women. Or he's just making out with anything he can find in this kitchen. <laughs> I'm not really sure which one it is. Um, but he gets covered in soot. He gets beaten up. He then gets really embarrassed. Um... And he orders them to be stripped in classic style. But they can't be stripped because their clothes are miraculously stuck to their bodies. So instead, uh, torturers burn um, Agape and Keon um, mm. alive. Their spirits, however, leave to heaven. But their clothes and bodies remain intact. So they die virgin martyrs. Um, which is a nice ending for them. The youngest daughter is sent to a brothel. But before she arrives, she's miraculously spirited away to a mountain uh, where she's then shot with some arrows. But the, the her virgin spirit leaves her body, so they all make it to heaven. So it's a happy ending. Rosafitha <laughs> was a laugh, really. I mean, they're comedies, but they're very I wish I could intense. See, I, mean, I wish I could God. see the first performance of that. I basically, very sadly, though, her work was lost until the 16th century. And they also thought they thought they were going to be closet, written as closet dramas. So they were written to be read, possibly read out loud, but not really performed. But I would love, love, love to see a of production this. That would just be amazing. This. I'd say, yeah. yeah, 
I, as you know, I love the concept of the closet drama. Again, it comes back to this whole thing of what is theatre. And like, I am convinced these yeah. would have been performed, even if it was by the nuns who were just around the room and performing, but that still is theatre of a kind. It doesn't have the red curtain. Even if it's just Roth Smither doing silly voices as she's writing the characters, which I feel like she probably could have done. I would have done it if I was writing it. But then I wasn't a canoness in 10th yeah. century Germany, so... We can't compare too much what I would do and, and what she Hossica sounds would do. badass and amazing. She's badass and she said, but she sadly um she didn't disappear. That sounds very mysterious. She was her her works were lost. For that again centuries. sounds like she kind of um, she shoved them into a kind of a messenger bottle and it's been bobbing around the Atlantic. And at a certain point, it just reappeared. Someone goes, oh hello, <laughs> what are these? Convenient. But no, so that's basically um early liturgical Christian drama and a fun sidebar. Fun sidebar. Fun, Pity we can't include her. I know she's not included, but I thought she's so important. Mm. I have to talk about her when we're talking about early religious drama because she's, she's amazing. Badass. Very I cool. Like her. All right, let's move on to the scoring. <laughs> we score every theatre style in three separate categories sleight of hand, scandal, ripple or riot, and legacy. I realise that's four. Whoops. <laughs> we give a score out of 10 for each category each, leading to a max total of 80. Finally, we decide whether this theatre style deserves to enter the esteemed House of Revels. And we imagine the House of Revels to be this great hall where only the best theatre can be performed. So let's head on to our first scoring category, Sleight of Hand. Sleight of we hand. explore the stagecraft in this theatre style, the props, the tricks and the trapdoors. So Liv, any trapdoors? Well, there are no trapdoors that I could find, Mingma, sadly. But I think they use quite a lot of tricks because... So mm -hmm. it all starts with antiphonal singing which, as I said, <laughs> isn't quite rap, but it's this idea of singing in two groups. It develops, they use costume and props, which, for people who didn't really like actors, is quite advanced. Um, and they also had people kind of playing characters. But there's also evidence to suggest that machinery was developed to <laughs> create such effects as angels descending during the nativity. Have we got another Deus Ex Machina? We might have another Deus Ex Machina, but oh. it's not it's not sort of like a like a sweep in, it's more of like the angels descending. Sort of I imagine strictly come dancing style. <laughs> uh, strictly come churching. <laughs> strictly come churching. Um but yeah, it actually made me think though, that must be quite scary if you're like in a medieval theatre, you're like, um, we don't have the health and safety in the harnesses, they're just going to strap you up and yeah, descend an adrenaline angel. rush. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Bye. you're like, we. <laughs> it's like Peter Pan in. <laughs> Bye. Um, but that's kind of all I could get for sleight of hand, really. Mm. I mean... Oh, I've got another one I've just thought of. Oh, yeah? Talking out my ass. The churches themselves. Yes. That's you know, true. It, it, churches are, you know, they did have to design what a church would look like once Christianity yeah. got legitimacy. And the moments when um, you're in church, say on the uh, on Easter Sunday, and I've had these moments where you have where you're in the church, and at ten thirty or whatever, uh, the music stops, the priest turns around and says, "Christ has risen." Now that moment, the sun just comes right down the window from a thousand years ago, built. Yeah. That is that the most amazing theatre. That's true. I haven't thought of it like that. And yeah, you've got so. I mean, I don't know, so I don't know why I think you would know, but I feel like you probably know that stained glass windows, yeah. when did they start appearing? Do you know? Ooh, that's a point. Um, I definitely know that there are some from the 12th century. Okay. Um, again, I think, I think there's a bit of supply and demand of that kind of stuff, because as, as we said earlier in the podcast, it's a, um, the churches were the community hub. And so I think if the rich mm. person, if they want to leave something to the community rather than you know, something, long, uh, something which has longevity, you would pay for something else. So you might pay for your plaque as you get older, you know, or for, your, for you to be buried inside the church. I'm not even sure if glass was particularly around at this point. That's kind of like how far back That's it's... That's true. I know the Normans had it when they came in 1066, but I'm not sure how much at this point it's around. Point being, that I know okay. that I think the stained glass is one of those things where the rich man, well, what do I give the church? you know a stained glass window is a very good kind of gift for you know for bettering your little parish church and this kind of thing to be fair my school when i was there got given um a big heap of money and they spent it on a stained glass window <laughs> wow wow okay. uh, a, a very expensive very nicely done stained glass skylight <laughs> disco <laughs> 10th century disco disco <laughs> 
it was it was it was very nice to be fair so i can very well imagine someone a thousand years ago doing the same thing basically for that reason i've given sleight of hand quite a low score I suppose it's like, what are we judging it on? Are we judging theatre in churches or are we judging... I think we have to judge the idea of theatre in churches in the the Quam Karatis, that context. I kind of feel like it's sort of... The church sort of went, no, no actors, and then they tried to revive it. So you're kind of... I feel a bit like, no, you don't get to have a better score than before because you've stopped it, (laughs) which is so unfair and so unreasonable. Um... But no, actually, I guess with the singing, the antiphonal singing and that harmony and and adding costume and props and different parts of the church Mm. and also if they did have descending angels and, like you say, the sun, maybe I'll give it... Do you know what? Maybe I'll give it a five for a slight Oh, you're now going higher than I was going to go. Interesting. Oh, well, I was originally going to go with three. I was thinking four, so I was in the middle. Okay, well, we'll we'll say say nine in total. Nice. Um, so then for sleight of hand yeah so nine out of 20 for sleight of hand all right on to the next category which is scandal Ooh. was there any juicy gossip surrounding this style whether on stage or off so live was there any source in the church i'm gonna say to you mingma it's the christian church <laughs> uh so basically nothing there are no big affairs there's no no one killing each other it's basically a little bit bland oh well that's real depressing i'm sorry i I mean i'm sure someone had sex on the altar but you know we can't kind of someone (laughs) it's all at this point very sort of top heavy and controlled yeah fair enough right okay nice fat zero nice fat zero from me too so it takes it to zero out of 20 scandal Oh, yeah. all right, Eric. So on we go to ripple or riot. Here we judge whether this style caused a ripple or a riot. How socially controversial was it? Was its existence and content? Did it spark wider conversations? So this actually, I've put quite high for ripple or riot because it kind of caused a riot. I think, Lynn, um, you need to stop doing predetermined scores because I'm going to convince you otherwise. <laughs> well, no, because... <laughs> no. The reason I say this is basically. Uh, it got too big for its boots and the church had to kick it outside the church. So basically, people loved it. As I said, they further developed it and they put um, a spice merchant in. They also put Jewish characters. They put soldiers guarding the tomb. They've got uh, Pontius Pilate comes in. They've got... They it's just literally kind of your go... primary school nativity. Where's the lobster? It was going to say, like, we should talk about nativities because that is... I mean, that's more for legacy, yeah. but it literally is like a nativity yeah. in, you know, in, like you say, in Love Actually, <laughs> when she's like, he's dressed as the lobster, and you're like, oh, I didn't realise there was a lobster. It's like, yeah, like, how many members of the audience can we get yeah. on stage in this story? So then the dialogue changed from Latin to the kind of dialogue that was spoken of the day. Mm. And then the church were like, ooh, this is a little bit, this is a little bit too far. And we're like, you need to take this outside the church. So it basically moved from inside the church to outside the church and developed into these whole other things called mystery plays and morality plays and miracle we'll plays, which we'll talk later. about later on. So it basically got too big for its boots. So I think it is quite high because I think it did cause a bit of a riot. Ooh, okay. Very wow. exciting. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Interesting. Hmm. hmm. Mm. Mm. What are you mm. thinking, Mingma? Mm. Um, mm. I'm also thinking about Alfred in theatre, which is our favourite right. Alfred the Great. Um, Alfred the Great. Which is, uh, as I think everyone will probably know, even though it's only the three episodes in, uh, I'm a nerd. <laughs> I'm a history nerd. Uh, and I was reading Melvin Bragg's Adventure of English. Mm. And there's a moment in it when he des- describes that uh, Alfred the Great encouraged theatre in churches and specifically encouraged clerics to perform which again is a part mm. of this new wave as you're talking about because he's he's again like how do you bring people in a it's the difficulty of um that we're doing such a wide period because there's, there's not much going on um so yeah. it's obviously it's a riot against the vatican but it's a ripple if the local king is helping it along. That's true. Liv comes in with one thing. Ming was like, oh, what about this way? And I'm like, oh, you are right, Ming. No. <laughs> Maybe it is a ripple. <laughs> no. Maybe it's just a little puddle on the floor. <laughs> it's interesting. It's more riotous than I thought it was going to be, which is, I'm going to say yeah. six. Oh, I'm going to say seven because I think it caused quite a big... Nice. 
commotion in the ocean, as they say. So that takes us to 13. Commotion in the ocean. 13 out of 20. So, Liv, how has this theatre style influenced the future? Well, Mingma, I don't know if you were ever in a nativity at school. Well, Liv, let me tell you, the donkey (laughs) shat on the carpet. (laughs) No, you had a real-life donkey in yours. It was the donkey originally, and then then he died, so it turned into a pony. But they always, always shat on the carpet. (laughs) It was like... Well, they're inside, they're panicking, they're like, where am I? I mean, along with the sheep and the chickens, and like, you know, we had a proper barnyard thing going on. You see, we just had, when I was in Brownies, we just had a very cold hall with like all our parents just watching and then everyone wanting to be an angel. Because I was always an angel because being the angel was the best part because you basically get to stand at the altar and read out like three lines of dialogue but wearing like a nice long white dress and you're like, I'm an angel. (laughs) And Jesus said, I mean, he didn't say it because he was a baby, but like (laughs) you can, (laughs) you can describe what happened. Yeah, Yeah, we, we had, we had the tradition that once you got Mary, you'd go Mm. Mary, Gabriel, Joseph, and then you'd be too old to do the play anymore. (gasps) That's (laughs) so harsh. (laughs) No, it was fine. I got to I got to Gabriel and then well, then our farmer um, and the farmer's wife died and so I didn't get to do oh, Joseph no. and of course like the bratty child I was I was more disappointed about not playing Joseph than I was <laughs> not getting all three uh, I played Joseph actually in my school one mm. um, and I remember this uh, the new this, there's a new girl at school and she was French and she played Mary. Uh, and that's all I can remember because I was too little. Yeah, but we didn't have any farm animals. I think that's the thing because you're it's we're like town mouse, country mouse. Uh, yeah, in the country we are actually. Animals. <laughs> yeah. We are. Yeah. As in 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 London, we just get a little bag of chips for baby Jesus. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, it, I suppose I wonder how much in other countries people do the nativity because it is so, it does seem like such an English thing that every school or everyone has done a nativity mm. at least once. Yeah, I was thinking this actually when I was doing it. It's very, like, traditional English, like you say. Like, mm-hmm. oh, everyone knows what a nativity is and we've all done them. We've all seen them. I mean, they've got the film, Nativity. And yet you're kind of, as an adult, you're kind of glad you did it as well, in a weird way. It's like a bonding thing that you don't realise everyone did. It's like when mm-hmm. you go through all those, like, songs that you sang at school, like... The hymns, and the... He's got the whole world in, in his, his You know that one? <laughs> He's got the whole wide world in his... his... Yeah. Well, you can tell I went to a, a C of E school. <laughs> um, if you were in a nativity or have seen a nativity, that basically comes from this. So that's its kind of legacy. So one of our biggest and childhood I... traditions comes from this. Is... From this, exactly. Um, Quaim Karatis is what started theatre up again. Mm-hmm. The, this this, this three-line antiphonal singing. Um, so it has a big legacy in the sense that it was another kickstart for theatre, but then... Yeah, we could also argue, though, that the antiphonal singing, another type of theatre is music, of course. It's hard because because all these origin ones are literally, you could put anything You're into like, oh, it's it the beginning. once you start. And it is, I should also yeah. say that for the ease of this episode, there are a couple of other things. So I know I mentioned before, you do have like pagan festivals also going on about this time. Um, and we do have mm. these wandering poets and some wandering, strolling performers. So it's not completely gone, but it is gone from the sense of kind of the mainstream theatre. This is what brought it back. Yeah. I think I'm going to give it a... S- A five, I think, Mingma. Yeah, I'll join you on five. Five? Okay. Because it kind of feels like you can't completely shaft the legacy of the early C of E. <laughs> you know, it feels a bit like God will smite us if, there's, if it's complete. Yeah, kind of... we can't do it. No. <laughs> well, five is a good, it's it's neither good or bad, so mm. um, it's good. So that brings us up to a grand total of counting 32 out of 80 32 out of 80 not too bad so it's, it's second place because last week was 40 44 i think it was 44 we can change Something it like that. we can change exciting. it exciting interesting like, yeah we can change it right now we, we can change it facts facts don't matter facts can change we can <laughs> Mingma, you've been in lockdown too long i don't know what that was <laughs> oh don't even oh, oh. my brain is going well, no, that's a pretty good score for the church uh, thinking actors were the devil. Um, actors were the devil and then they weren't. And then brilliant. it was a way for spreading the Christian message, basically, yeah. in short. Liv, final question. Uh, does this theatre style join the illustrious, the esteemed House of Revels? 
<sighs> I don't think it does. I think it's... I mean, I do like... Obviously, we have nativities, and mm. that's very nice. But I don't think it's quite up there with... Um, I mean, I don't even think it's quite up there with Roman theatre. I'm just not convinced whether it's one of the greats of British theatre. Yeah. I mean, I my kind of immediate opinion is... If part of this theatre style was them telling us that all the actors are the devil, you don't want that bloke, (laughs) (laughs) you know, in the place where all the actors are, do you? This really hypocritical guy who's like, uh, actors are the worst, unless they do it about spreading the Christian message. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, God. Uh, We all know that guy. He's like, you can't do it, but I can. So I don't think it does make it into the House of Revel Sadie, but I have to say it's been really interesting to learn about. Uh, I particularly Mm. love learning about hot... I forgot. Roswitha. I was going so well this whole episode. I was like, I have not pronounced a single word wrong. I'm very proud of myself. Uh, Roswitha. Um, but no, I don't think it does make it into the House of Revels. Wonderful. All right. Yes. So next episode, we are heading on to Viking storytelling. Woo! Ooh. And I think the first thing I have to do is justify why the hell we're t- we are talking about Vikings. And <laughs> Yeah, why are we talking about Vikings? Let's find out next time. <laughs> oh, I have to tune in. <laughs> ooh, ooh, you know, clickbait. Ooh. Anyway, see you then. But we also have some kind of wandering poets and some wandering stroll strollers. Some stroll oh, I was gonna say where am I going with this? Prams. Some strolling <laughs> actors.